Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. This is my third time trying to start this thing. I think my microphones are on. I think the video is going. We're talking about January 14th training day. I might talk a little bit quieter because the little one is asleep. Yes, I'm a dad, dad mode. My goal is to be the most athletic dad as possible and share that journey along with you guys. Now, yesterday I was tired. It's a Sunday, we've had so much snow here. Um, and the amount of, I wonder how much, how many total pounds of snow I've shoveled. Now, the first time it snowed, it was heavy snow. And then the second time it snowed, it was moderately heavy, but it got what do they call drifts. So it was like minus 15 degrees with like 30 degree, 30, 30 degree, 30 mile power winds. And so all the snow just piles up. It's like ice snow and it's like three feet high across the sidewalks. So you're digging snow, literally digging like down through the snow. It's exhausting. I had to do that a couple times yesterday. So the workout wasn't really great. I was kind of tired. I said, well, this is a great opportunity to try and move really fast, but not produce lots of force. And so what I mean by that, I did a bunch of weird looking exercises to the external observer. And the whole theme of the day was try and move my limbs as fast as I could, period. Now against not much weight. So you'll see band resistant stuff. You'll see body weight stuff, really light barbell work. And I'll just let all the exercise clips roll through here. And what we're working on here is the brain communicating to the muscles to talk as fast as they can. And so if you think about a boxer, a boxer can throw their hands really fast. Now they didn't throw their hands really fast or learn to do that by lifting really heavy weight. They learned to do that by practicing that by moving as fast as they could. And the bench press king, who can bench press, you know, whatever, 500 pounds, didn't get great like that because they practiced throwing punches. They are two different means in which our body produces force. And both of them are actually pretty important for sport, right? If I want to move quickly and I'm twitchy like an athlete, I want to grab something or I want to steal a basketball, I want to feel the ground ball. Having some quickness is really important. But also if I want to dunk on somebody or move someone off the line, I need to be explosive. So maybe the heavier lifting is important. And there's something in the middle ground where it's like a hybrid of the two. But by nature, there's two distinct properties and it's pretty observationally easy to prove, um, let alone you can actually prove it through research um, and investigation of how the neural system, your brain, produces force. And they've done research papers and studies where they produce force and they say they uh, to do what's called an isometric uh, let's say squat. You've seen me do isometric squat. I'll share that one <clears throat> with the belt squat. And I drive against the, I try to squat up against an immovable object, in this case the chains, the research studies probably pulled against pins, and they measure the force production on the force plates in the ground. So the force plates have what's called um, a force transducer. So it measures like, you can think like compression per second, and it measures really, really fast, like 3,000 times per second, so really fast the units. And you push into the ground, and you push, 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 push as hard as you can. It's registering the force that you're producing to the ground. And what they found was, well, if I wait a really long time, like two seconds, and I just push as much force as I possibly can, and after two seconds, I say, oh, how much force can I produce? Um, that quality of force production is highly dependent on, you know, the muscle cross-sectional size, like how big the muscle is if I'm doing curls, like how big my bicep is, maybe the fiber types in there, how many motor units I'm recruiting. But then you might look at something, well, okay, sport doesn't happen in two seconds. Maybe it happens in 0.2 seconds. What's responsible for the force production during 0.2 seconds? And you could say, well, all these guys who are really strong, they didn't all produce the same kind of force, right? If it was just maximal strength and how much strength you could you know, how much you could lift would dictate initial 0.2 seconds. And we'd see all the really strong guys, the maximal bench press kings, also be able to throw the fastest hands. But the guys who were able to produce force really fast at the very beginning had a different kind of means of producing force. Well, it's obviously the same contractile machinery, that is the muscle fibers. The speed at which the brain talked to those muscles, what we call rate coding, the speed at which those impulses, maybe you could think of traveling down the neurons to the muscles, conduction velocity from your brain, your motor cortex into your muscle fibers. And it goes, hey, produce force really fast. And it goes, Pew, and it, you know, it produces force initially, like the initial strike of a hand, moving your hand. Now it's not going to be the most amount of force in the world that compared to the bench press guy. But if you produce more force over that 0.2 period of seconds, at that little short time period, the person who threw the punch first 
faster you know, initial contraction and rate of force development, hence the name rate of force development, actually is stronger because they produce more force. Now, if I expand that out to the two second mark, the, the maximal bench press king is stronger. They produce way more force. So we're trying to train those different qualities. And so you might see me doing these weird exercises. I'm trying to move really fast. And I might also do some of this in my regular training where I'm jumping with lighter weights. Not everything's maximally heavy all the time. Um, and that's really the whole purpose of this. And now on this day, I push it to the furthest extreme, right? Minimal weight, I'm tired, but I still wanna turn my nervous system on and go fast. I didn't wanna do slow, lethargic things. I'm training to be more athletic. And so by default, I will opt into the move fast, lightweight version versus, oh, let's just do the really heavy weight, slow pace stuff. And I think that's important for athletes. When you think about your off days, you shouldn't just arbitrarily do off days because you're exposing your body still to a stimulus. Maybe you want to remove the total intensity and metabolic demand of the stimulus. So you reduce the metabolic breakdown by sets, reps, and total um, tension, maybe like the weight of the bar creates certain tension in the muscles. When it's a little bit heavier, you get more mechanical breakdown, which requires more recovery time, but you don't want to do that. And so you say, mm, I'll do something a little bit lighter and a little bit faster. It doesn't have the same mechanical tension wear and tear. So that's the whole concept behind that day. I haven't actually programmed it into my athlete training team. And after doing that day yesterday, I was like, I should really program that. So I might put that into my training team for now on, for those of you interested in learning a little bit more about it. Um, that basically sums up the day. I just did a whole body of work, a whole bunch of exercises, training my whole body. Um, and then I ate a whole bunch of pizza from my favorite pizza places. Now, I really like pizza. Um, Iowa doesn't have the most diverse selection of pizza. When I lived in Denver, we had a lot more pizza you could pick from. And I really like this place called Pizza Republica in Denver. Um, it was Neapolitan pizza, I believe. And now here in Iowa, I got this place called Low Pies. It's New York style pizza, but they... I think it's a little different than New York style pizza. It is like kind of, it's a little crispier. The cheese isn't so excessively thick. It's really good. It's really wonderful. It's not wood fire. I'm not sure what they use to cook it with, but it's awesome. It has a nice charred bottom. It's crispy. It's thin. Um, I get what's called, I call it the, the, the garbage pizza. That's not called that. It's called the garden pizza. I call it the garbage pizza because it's like all the produce that you threw into the garbage that went bad onto a pizza. And I put sausages on it. And I think that's really good with cheese. Excellent. Really good. You can tell how good a pizza place is by the cheese pizza. So I do agree with uh, the pizza review Dave Portnoy himself that he says you have to try the cheese pizza. Maybe he just likes cheese pizza. But I think if it, like when you try ice cream, you have to try the vanilla ice cream first. If you go to an ice cream shop, Parlor. I like the word parlor because it sounds like I'm the 19 whenevers and I'm going to drive up in my really fancy, not fancy, but cool uh, Corvette, which is like, you know, the rounded out version was at the 60s, something like that. And Fonzie's going to say, hey, yeah, I'm going to go to my ice cream parlor. And some guy with a cool little hat's going to give me some ice cream. And you go to the ice cream place, parlor, whatever it might be, always have vanilla first. If the vanilla is not good, the rest of the ice cream is not going to be good because they're going to try to mask the poor vanilla with toppings and ingredients like um, Oreos and Reese's, and they'll just put a conglomerate of other sugary treats on there that's just gonna mask the deficiencies of the vanilla. If you have a really good vanilla ice cream, that will hold its weight. When you have a great vanilla ice cream, you can add fruits to it, which are like blackberries are awesome. Um, maybe like a blueberry, or if you have, what's the Portland one? Is it not boysen, is it? Portland's known for a berry. It's, a, it's like a dark blueberry, I'm totally blanking on it very famous cherry. If you have a good vanilla base, you can make do with anything else. And you can have additives that are just, you know, not the star of the show, but like a, like a good basketball team, the additive is a role player. If the Oreo is not the star, it is the enhancement of the vanilla flavor. I'm not a big chocolate guy, so I assume if you're a chocolate ice cream connoisseur, you would go with that as well. My favorite ice cream, bar none, is Tillamook ice cream. Tillamook ice cream is the best ice cream. You can get it at the store, we get it at Target. It's always the best price at Target. Mudslide, I'm not a chocolate ice cream guy. It's chocolate ice cream. It's out of this world. We eat it all the time. Also, Oreo ice cream there is, not Oreo, cookies and cream, I guess they have to call it, is phenomenal. Their vanillas are excellent. Whenever I get a pie, uh, I prefer cherry, strawberry, strawberry rhubarb, um, apples, fine. But cherry and strawberry rhubarb are awesome. I like a sweeter pie. Apple is just kind of a little too cinnamony for me. Dole. Um, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. 
and the ice cream I get from there is Tillamook ice cream. The vanilla, I don't get, uh, maybe I do get the old, flash, old fashioned that goes with my pie, not the vanilla bean. Both are really excellent, by the way. Tillamook ice cream, A1, spectacular. So a little pizza action, a little ice cream action. Um, actually, I don't have enough ice cream. I would like to buy some ice cream now, talking about this. I have to buy pints of ice cream or like the tubs because I used to get, go to Costco and get like those ice cream bar things, which I love, by the way, the little ice cream bar with the chocolate covering on it and the little crispies on the outside. Um, I'm not sure what they're called. It's a classic chocolate ice cream bar. And I would eat those just by the handful. Because these are just, they're amazing. Um, and they're better towards the end. So you always, they start off and they're not melted and thawed all the way. You start eating your ice cream uh, and it starts to thaw and it gets that optimal thaw at the very end and it leaves you wanting another one. And so you open another one up and the first bite isn't as good as the previous one. So it's an ascension profile. So you go up, 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 up and taste. And then you have that one last taste they've been working for this whole time. Like, oh, that was great. So you think the next bar is going to taste like that. And then you have the next bite and it goes up, 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 up. But you have a deficit. So you have a reduction in quality or expected outcome. But as you eat, it creeps back up to that expected outcome. So you're like, oh, well, I've already took a bite. I'll keep eating it. And you get back to that point again. You're like, oh, that was so excellent. I should have another one. And it keeps this horrible cyclic pattern of like up, down, up, down, up, down. It's the inverse of what people think because people think, oh, I should have a really great bite at the beginning and maybe a worse bite at the end. That doesn't, want you, that doesn't leave you wanting more. You want the best bite at the end if you're making an ice cream bar. That's what makes it great is the fact you want more and more. So ice cream, pizza, workout, nervous system, um, and shoveling lots of snow. I appreciate you guys as always. Thanks for supporting these videos. Hope you guys enjoy and take care.